Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Iraqi President Jalal Talabani expressed hopes that the trial of former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein will occur within two months. Meanwhile, four U.S. soldiers, four Italian soldiers, and an Iraqi soldier were killed in two helicopter crashes in two separate incidents in eastern Baghdad. In other news, a U.S. military helicopter was forced into an emergency landing in Tel Afar, west of Mosul, after gunmen opened fire at the chopper, and a truck filled with explosives detonated, killing and wounding Iraqis near an Iraqi checkpoint in Baqoba, east of Baghdad. The situation in Iraq is escalating with every new day. Twelve people were killed or wounded when a truck filled with explosives detonated near an Iraqi checkpoint at the Kanaan Bahraz crossing near Baqoba, about 65 kilometers north of Baghdad. The booby trap truck drove to the Kanahan crossing, killing two people and wounding eight others. Gunmen opened fire at a U.S. helicopter, forcing it into an emergency landing in the city of Tel Afar, west of Mosul. These attacks are occurring at a time when Iraqi Prime Minister Ibrahim al-Ja'fari defended the presence of the coalition forces, saying that they are not occupation forces, reiterating that their presence is related to the security needs of Iraq. As an elected government, it is a matter of necessity. The multinational forces cannot leave Iraq now. The security situation is still unstable. Meanwhile, the Iraqi government is conducting the largest military campaign since the collapse of Saddam Hussein's regime, searching for foreign fighters and gunmen in Baghdad. The Ministry of Interior can't solve this on its own. There has to be internal cooperation from the people to stop the terrorism. These efforts aim at putting an end to the increased acts of violence and building confidence among the public. Six people were killed in fast food restaurants in Karachi when Shiite protesters set fire in retaliation for the suicide attack against their mosque. The attack on the Shiite mosque in Kulgan Iqbal killed five people, including the two attackers. These intense flames of hatred in Pakistan are getting even more intense. More than 4,000 people have been killed since the early 1990s, and it seems that more and more people will continue to be killed. Three days ago, 19 people were killed, and 100 others were injured in a sectarian attack. Today, at least 11 people have been killed, and 20 others were injured when a Shiite mosque in Karachi was targeted. When the worshippers were performing the first part of the prayers, I heard the sound of many bullets being fired. I thought they were clashes with police officers. Then I heard a strong explosion in which one of the suicide bombers was killed even before he reached the worshippers. Five people were killed in the tragic attack yesterday, including the two attackers, one police officer, and two worshippers. The armed attackers entered a Shiite mosque during the evening prayers in Kulgan and Karachi. The attackers, who were loaded with explosives, randomly opened fire on the worshippers and clashed with the security guards. This tragic science of violence and counter-violence has become ordinary in Pakistan. Six charred bodies were also discovered by the police in a nearby restaurant. They were killed when angry Shiite protesters set the restaurants on fire in retaliation for yesterday's incident. They set fire to the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant, located next to the mosque. Only a few hours before this incident, the bodies of a Sunni religious leader and a former parliament member were found with bullet wounds. Three days earlier, the shrine of the Sufi Imam Bari, which is visited by both Sunnis and Shiites, was attacked as soon as the Sunni worshippers left the site. The attackers waited until the Sunni worshippers finished their annual visit before attacking the Shiite worshippers at the shrine. It seems that these killings were planned by the Alta movement. 
The Pakistani Islamic groups are stuck in a downward spiral of violence. Every time the government tries to stop the fire of violence, someone else starts it again. The Palestinian Hamas ground has set it with boycott a rerun of Palestinian municipal elections, stoking tensions with President Mahmoud Abbas' Fatah party over the annulment of Islamist victories in the polls. A potential solution surfaced later when a Fatah leader said it had agreed to put off tomorrow's rerun for an unspecified period. A Hamas spokesman said his group would not participate for fear of fraud. Hamas has signaled it might accept a rerun if held later to give Islamists more time to prepare. Egyptian mediation fa failed last week to resolve the row between Hamas and Fatah over the May 5th election outcome in Gaza. Chief Palestinian negotiator Saab Arakat has met an Egyptian dele delegation in the West Bank town of Jericho to discuss the row over and consolidating a ceasefire agreed by Abbas and Palestinian factions. In the West Bank, Israeli and foreign peace activists joined Palestinian protesters trying to block constructions of Israel's separation wall. This coupled with Israeli forces during the protest against the barrier Israel is erecting on confiscated land belonging to the West Bank village of Berlin. Protesters lay underneath the fence were wired, bringing constructions to a halt until Israeli forces arrived to disperse them. Israeli troops detained at least two of the protesters who were told they entered a closed military zone. French President Jacques Chirac has named loyalist Dominique de Villepin as his new prime minister in a shake-up of the government following his crushing defeat over the European Union constitution. Villepin replaces the unpopular Jean-Pierre Raffarin, which who, who out earlier in the day. He is a former interior and foreign minister who had angered the United States, but won French hearts with his fierce opposition to the U.S.-led war in Iraq. Nida Ramahi has more. Two days after French voters shook up the government of Jacques Chirac by overwhelmingly voting no to a new European constitution, Chirac has acted by appointing Dominique de Valpin prime minister in place of Jean-Pierre Raffarin. But with the appointment of Chirac's close ally, financial markets have shelved hopes of significant economic reforms because they don't see de Valpin as making major policy changes. De Valpin has the tough task of ensuring the electorate does not punish the ruling centre-right party in presidential elections two years from now for perceived economic failure. This means slowing high unemployment, which is above the EU average of 10.2, boosting sagging business and regaining household confidence. But trying to make these changes means France will be unable to cut its deficit to below the EU cap of 3% of gross domestic product in 2005 and next year, leading to frictions between Paris and Brussels. The French voters' snub of the EU constitution has made an impact on other countries, with Dutch voters expected to follow France's suit by rejecting the new charter tomorrow. Traders have also been affected by France's vote, with the euro trading below one and a quarter dollars. This is Nidana Mahi for Jordan Television. Three Syrian intelligence officers have reportedly been managing a major electoral alliance against opposition candidates in North Lebanon when voters cast their ballots for new MPs on June 19th. The Daily Al Mustakbal and An Nahar newspapers named the three Syrian officers and said they are based in Tripoli. Damascus is under, under strong international pressure not to interfere in legislative polls after it pulled out its military from Lebanon in April. Meanwhile, preparations are underway for new rounds of elections, especially in Mount Lebanon, although voters in the south take to the polls on Sunday. An alliance between Hezbollah and Amal there guarantees both groups a major victory. Sarah Khouri has more. 
Former exiled general Michel Ron, who recently fell out with the opposition, criticized the polls in Beirut, saying they manifested a rejection of the electoral law. Ron's free patriotic movement, which has, however, sponsored candidates in other districts, said the electoral law prevented Christians from gaining true representation. He said petrodollars had swayed voters and accused one faction of dangerously controlling the rest, further stoking sectarian tensions in the country. Aoun has forged electoral alliances with staunchly pro-Syrian MP Talal Asran for the hotly contested Babda Ghalay district and is reportedly in talks with former minister Sleiman Frangiye, another Damascus ally for the elections in the north. Aoun had come under heavy criticism after hinting at a similar deal with former interior minister Michel Moore in the Metan. He is vying against an accepted strong showing by opposition MP Walid Jumblot, who is allied with the Lebanese forces in Mount Lebanon. A top ally of Jumblot, candidate for West Bekaa and Rashaya drew seat, while Abu Faroud said he was surprised at Raoun's alliance with pro Syrian figures, which he described as remnants of the military regime. He stressed that the main point of discord that foiled an electoral alliance was Raoun's insistence on naming his confidant, Raisam Abu Jamra, as candidate in the Barabda Ghalay constituency. Raoun distanced Abu Jamra from the new coalition. Abu Faroud warned against reviving the military regime starting with Baghdad Palace in reference to pro-Syrian president Emil Lahoud, who blamed the electoral law for the low turnout in parliamentary polls in Beirut, but stayed silent on the sweeping win scored by his main political rival son, Saad al-Hariri. Lahoud had supported the law drafted when Damascus was the key power broker, both on the ground and in the corridors of power, a role which ensured the pro-Syrian camp triumphed in the three legislative elections held since the end of the 1975 to 1990 civil war. Lahoud has criticized the election law adopted in 2000, but he was accused of only attempting to sow discord among opposition ranks and derail elections. Christian figures have said it effectively allows Muslims to choose many of the Christian deputies in the assembly. Hariri and his allies in the anti-Syrian opposition have also criticized the law, but decided it was more important to hold elections on time than try to draft a new one in haste. The vote follows two political earthquakes in Lebanon, Hariri's killing and a bombing many Lebanese blame on Damascus, and the end of Syria's 29-year troop presence last month. Lebanon has some 3 million eligible voters, 59% Muslims and 41% Christians, who are voting for 128 parliamentary seats to be shared equally by the Christian and Muslim communities. Lahoud's political survival may be at stake after the elections. MP elect Saad Rafiq al Hariri called for a massive turnout in Mount Lebanon legislative elections on June 12th and reaffirmed commitment to an alliance with MP Wali Jumblat. Hariri, who received a delegation representing future movement teachers alongside Mrs. Nazik Hariri, praised voters in Beirut for the resounding victory that his three coalition tickets scored. He pledged to bolster coexistence, national conciliation, reform, and the Taif peace accord. The son of murdered former Premier Rafi Hariri scored a clean sweep in the Beirut round of Lebanon's elections, the first in three decades, held free of the grip of neighboring Syria. Interior Minister Hassan Sabah told a news conference that Hariri's list won in all three constituencies in the capital, where a total of 19 parliamentary seats were up for grabs. Hariri received congratulatory calls from heads of states and Arab and foreign officials. Officials put the turnout at 28% from 33.8% in the last 2000 legislative polls and 22% from the last municipal polls. Hariri's success, he said, was a tribute to his father, whose February killing in a Beirut bomb blast triggered a major political upheaval in Lebanon that led Damascus to end its 29-year military presence. His list won nine seats by default due to a lack of rival candidates. Final results nationwide would not be known until after June 19th, when the final round of the four-stage election is held. Saber attributed the low Beirut turnout to the fact that Hariri's candidates were assured of victory with the pro-Syrian camp on the retreat, adding some parties had also called for a boycott. Saad himself won 39,499 votes, the largest number of votes in all constituencies. He told cheering crowds outside his Kratim residence, this is a victory for Rafi Hariri, the blood of Rafi Hariri will not go in vain. Hariri stressed in an interview with Newsweek magazine, Lebanon still had some symbols of the past who brought the country so much harm. Hariri said if Lebanese were able to get rid of them after the elections, he would be interested in taking the premier's post. He was apparently referring to the heads of state's continued presence. Turnout was especially low in Beirut's Christian areas, where some parties had called for a boycott due to electoral disputes. 
As soon as Saad claimed victory late Sunday, he called for national reconciliation in a country still bearing the scars of the 15-year civil war and extended an open hand to all factions who helped the campaign that led to the Syrian pullout. Khani Hamoud, editor-in-chief of the Al Mustaqbal Daily, said working towards national unity after the elections would be achieved with the drafting of a new electoral law to replace the current one, which was drafted by the Lebanese authorities and the services under Syria's tutelage. He stressed the electoral law has rightfully frustrated many Lebanese, mainly the Christians. Hamoud said the first mission of Saad Hariri and his allies in the opposition will be to start dialogue for a new electoral law, following a compromise with all parties. Residents of the Gush Katif settlement of Kfar Darom today refused to meet with the visiting Director General of the Prime Minister's office, Ilan Cohen. Cohen had planned to meet local officials for a discussion of compensation issues ahead of disengagement, but settlers protested Cohen's arrival and locked the gates, blocking his entrance to the settlement. The government has been negotiating with settler leaders in a bid to convince them to voluntarily leave their businesses and homes before the August pullout. Cohen is trying to convince local residents to relocate to the town of Nitsanim. We get more on that controversial issue in this report from Sheila Zucker. In an effort to solve the controversial and much discussed relocation of Gaza residents, the government is turning to some creative thinking. It's exploring options under Article 85 of the Evacuation Compensation Law, which deals with the collective relocation of settlers. This article is not only the legal foundation for the Nitzanim plan, it's the vehicle that the Disengagement Administration, called SELA, plans to use to allocate more farmland to Gush Katif farmers than the Knesset intended. Since Attorney General Menachem Mazuz's decision, published Monday, rejected two of the three options proposed by the Cabinet, urgent consultations began at the Prime Minister's office. With less than three months left of disengagement, the Construction and Housing Ministry has chosen a subsidiary of the Jewish Agency to manage the housing of evacuated settlers in the Ashkelon Nitzan area. Today is the last day for Gush Katif residents to sign up for the Nitzanim plan, according to a request issued by Justice Minister Tzipi Livni. The state stressed that this does not constitute an ultimatum. Settlers petitioned the court for an interim injunction against the Livni seven-day time frame. Pushing to get more settlers to sign up for the Nitzanim relocation plan, Prime Minister's Office Director General Elon Cohn visited the Gush Katif settlement block today, but residents barred his entry. This is Sheila Zucker for IVA News. Amnesty International today published its annual report, which charges Israel with, quote, extrajudicial executions and the deaths of some 700 Palestinians, including 150 children. The report calls some of the IDF actions in the territories war crimes and crimes against humanity. Amnesty said that in the same period, Palestinian terrorists killed 109 Israelis, 67 of them civilians, eight of them children. Yachad Meretz, Knesset member Zahava Galon, has called for an urgent meeting of the Knesset Law Committee to discuss the report. However, despite the negative findings, Amnon Vidan, Director General of Amnesty International in Israel, said the group feels that encouraging progress has been made in protecting human rights in Israel and in the territories. In a chapter devoted to the Palestinian Authority, the human rights group said 750 prisoners are being held in Palestinian prisons, most of them without trial, many of them are beaten and tortured in jail. International charged Israeli occupation troops of committing war crimes against Palestinian citizens and humanity in its annual report for the year 2004, which was issued today. Amnesty pointed out that the occupation troops killed last year more than 700 citizens, of whom 150 were children. The report asserted that most of the casualties were as a result of Israeli indiscriminate shooting, shelling of populated areas, and executive use of force. The report added that the occupation troops demolished hundreds of Palestinian citizens' houses in addition to using Palestinian citizens as human shields to protect its soldiers. 
the matter which Amnesty described as war crimes against humanity. The Ansar Sunna group announced that it has killed the Japanese hostage, Akahiko Sito, who disappeared in Iraq on May 8th. The Japanese foreign ministry did not officially confirm the news, but the victim's brother said that most likely Sito is dead. The Iraqi government condemned the killing of Sito, and the Iraqi Minister of National Security, Abdel Karim El Anze, said that this criminal act will not affect the Japanese-Iraqi relations. The extremist Islamist group Ansar Sunnah declared that it has killed the Japanese hostage Akahiko Sito, a former soldier who was kidnapped in Iraq on May 8th in an ambush on his vehicle while it was returning from an American military base near Baghdad. A video on the internet showed images of what the extremist group claimed to be the body of Sito, which was shot to death. The video image of Sito's body, an identification card and passport were not dated. In response to the images, a spokesman for the Japanese foreign ministry announced that it is trying to verify the authenticity of the images and that this is a difficult task because one cannot be sure just by watching the video images. The Japanese foreign minister said that he had asked the family of the hostage to watch the video images. However, Sito's younger brother said that the foreign ministry has notified his family that it is very likely that the body is his brother. The British Heart Security company where Akihiko Sito worked announced that Sito may have been killed in the ambush that was planned by Ansar Sunnah group. Sito was born in Tokyo and served in the Japanese army and airborne division for two years before going to Iraq. He is not linked to the 600 Japanese forces deployed in the Samawa in southern Iraq that are helping in the reconstruction efforts. Among our headlines, at the presidential headquarters, Algerian President Abdel Aziz Bouteflika welcomed the prominent Islamic scholar Imam Dr. Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi. It should be mentioned that Imam al-Qardawi is currently in Algeria, where on Sunday he participated in the first international meeting regarding the scholar Mohammed al-Bashir al-Ibrahimi. On this occasion, Sheikh Kardawi expressed his support of President Bouteflika's efforts to implement the National Reconciliation Campaign. After the President welcomed the scholar, Dr. Yusuf al Kardawi said the following to our colleague, Sausan bin Hadid. We spoke about many topics, the issue of Arabs and Muslims and Northern Africa and particularly Algeria. We live at a time when we must pay attention to the entire Muslim community, especially in Algeria. We discuss these issues from Islamic, Arab, national, intellectual and traditional perspectives. We must balance the intellectual and the traditional with the past, the present and the future. When we do this, we see that the situation from a comprehensive and balanced perspective, because some people view issues with a narrow perspective or in an opportunist or unrealistic way. We try to look at these situations in a way that blends the ideal with the realistic and blends the modern with the future. We look at the issue of Algeria in the framework of the Islamic community and the Arab community. Actually, I found that I completely agree with the Honorable President and I found that his opinions are genuine and come from the heart. He is concerned about Algeria and he is pained by anything that harms Algeria. Because of this, he views Arab and Muslim issues realistically and intelligently, paying attention to what is possible and what is impossible. Because some people want the impossible, things cannot be implemented. So he sees things this way, thank God. I think that the views of the Honorable President are just like my views, and I thank God. Thousands running who 
Hoodoos have fled into neighbouring Burundi, fearing the revenge of the survivors of Rwanda's genocide. More details in the following report. Jenny Banda is a man of the move. He only arrived at this camp in Negozi, northern Burundi, a few days ago, crossing Burundi's border with Rwanda to get here. But tomorrow, all of the 600 people who are staying here will have to move on again. The camp is less than 10 kilometers away from Rwanda, and over the last month, it has been a steady trickle of refugees. Most are ethnic Hutus who are scared that they might face persecution from the victims of the 1994 genocide in which 800,000 mostly ethnic Tutsis were killed. Burundi's authorities are saying that they can't stay, and today, a delegation of Rwandan and Burundian authorities has come to the camp to persuade its inhabitants to leave. Many of the refugees maintain that they didn't come here to escape the genocide-related trials back home, but because their lives are in real danger. Jane says that he fled from his village when he heard that black pigeons were arming themselves with the sticks and hoes to kill Hutus. He now says that those rumors appear to be false and he is preparing to move his family back home. But he doubts that many others will follow his example. Back in Rwanda, court sessions trying those suspected of involvement in the genocide are in full swing. Earlier this month, tens of thousands gathered at the sports stadium in the capital Kigali to witness the trial of a senior officer in the Rwandan army. Major General Monia Kazi was tried under a traditional court system known as Gakaka, which was set up in 2002 to deal with the massive backlog of suspects. Gakaka means grass, and most hearings are held doubtful, with local villagers as judges, although it has been praised for giving communities a way of reconciling and moving on, it has also been criticized for its informal way of dispensing justice. But the major perpetrators of the genocide are still being tried by conventional court, the international tribunal in neighboring Tanzania. There have also been high-profile trials elsewhere. In 2001, two Rwandan nuns were tried by a Belgian court. Belgian law allows prosecutors to try war crime suspects even if they aren't Belgian, and if their crimes were committed abroad. On the 9th of May this year, a new trial opened in Belgium, in which two Rwandans stand accused of helping militias to kill about 50,000 people. It is still unclear whether Jen and the others who fled to Burundi are criminals who should be extradited or victims who need protection. But the day after Nguzi's governor came to their camp, it was closed down and everyone had to move. Most headed further south to Songor, a temporary camp set up by the UN Refugee Agency until the asylum issue is settled. In spite of James' plans to return home, he and his family were among those who relocated to Songoro. Rwanda may be a tiny country, but its internal affairs have spilled over into the entire Great Lakes region for over a decade now. Eleven years after the genocide ended, it continues to haunt not just Rwanda, but also its neighbors. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.